Roger Eddy, thanks for joining us on the Illinois Channel. Great to see you, and I should tell the audience first that uh, one of the titles that we're not going to be bringing up, but you also served on the Illinois Channel Board of Directors, and we uh, finally can have you back on, uh, as we have had in the past, both when you were a lawmaker and then when you were the chairman of the uh, Illinois Association of School Boards, and you served in that capacity as well. Uh, for a number of years. So uh, welcome to the Illinois Channel. Well, thank you, Terry. It's, uh, it's nice to see you. We're going to be talking about a, a book, and I'll bring up for the audience uh, your book title is that you just wrote, A Front Row Seat, The Impeachment of Rod Blagojevich. But as I recall uh, you telling me before we spoke today that your your book, uh, which I believe just came out, uh, also goes into other things besides the impeachment of Rod Blagojevich. Uh, it's, tell, us, tell us what the uh, book is overall and, and why you came to uh, write it. Well, the book uh, kind of expanded from the original premise. I, I had a lot of folks uh, during the late fall and, and up to the impeachment trial of uh, Donald Trump asking questions uh, about the impeachment of Rod Blagojevich. I uh, was uh, actually sworn in as a state representative the uh, same uh, time, same year, that Rod Blagojevich was uh, inaugurated uh, in his first term. So uh, during the time he was in office, uh, covered uh, the span of time that I was in office, and, and folks around here knew that I served on the special investigative committee that uh, recommended uh, impeachment to the full house. So uh, there were a lot of questions and several uh, of my friends mentioned that maybe you should write a book uh, because a lot of the details surrounding Blagojevich uh, and that uh, those years and the impeachment uh, were details they weren't aware of, uh, especially contrasted to what was happening with the impeachment of Trump. Uh, and as I did that, um, you know, kind of expanded into how this uh, kind of small town school superintendent uh, ended up in the front row of an impeachment trial, first one ever in the history of Illinois. And uh, so there's where the title came from, a front row seat. I, I sat in the front row uh, on the special investigative committee uh, when we heard all the evidence. So. Uh, it recalls some of my elections. Uh, it recalls uh, a lot of the time that uh, I worked in the House, a lot of the people I worked with in the House. And it kind of turned into a bit of a civics lesson uh, because uh, I, I take folks through how uh, law is made, not the schoolhouse rock version, uh, but the, how a bill really becomes a law. Uh, I, I talk a lot about the House rules about how uh, the Illinois House of Representatives is kind of run and how difficult it is to get legislation through, especially uh, if you're in the minority party. So it, it turned into a lot more, uh, but it does center and focus on the evidence uh, that was gathered by the investigative committee and, and why at the end of the day, that committee recommended the impeachment of a governor for the first time in the history of the state. We have you up as being in Hudsonville, which I would say is over in the central east part of the state, right? I mean, you're, how far away are you from Indiana? Well, uh, we, we live about two miles from the border. We live in the country. Uh, the city, the little town where I was school superintendent, uh, is right on the Wabash River. So I used to be able to throw a rock across in Indiana, but uh, there'll be two problems now. I'm two miles away. Plus, I don't think my arm would be even do it if I was standing on the banks these days, Terry. But yeah, we're right here, East Central Illinois, beautiful Wabash River Valley, and uh, uh, right on that border. And and I I wanted to say that uh, the the fact of the matter is that. You know, a lot of people, they think every lawmaker is from Chicago, and I wanted to make that clear that you're not. You're a downstater, and so you bring that perspective, which is great because uh, a lot of times we don't do enough. Uh, maybe the Illinois Channel hasn't. We're looking to improve that, are covering voices from around all the corners of Illinois. And we need to have the people in the Chicagoland area have a better appreciation on all these, how these issues that are passed out of Springfield impact all the corners. 
But let's uh, let's go back uh, to the point. Uh, we were talking about the impeachment of Rob Agoyevich, as everyone knows. The former governor was just let out of federal prison earlier this year, and he uh, has continued to say that he had done nothing wrong and he was railroaded. Given your own experience with uh, Rob Agoyevich, uh, what would you say? Was he railroaded, and did he deserve to be impeached and removed from office? Well, there, there are two different, two separate issues here. One is the impeachment and the removal from office, and one is obviously the federal trial, which resulted in his sentence. Uh, and you know, there are a lot of different opinions about whether or not that sentence uh, was was too harsh, or whether the commutation. Uh, by uh, President Trump was uh, the wrong thing to do. But as far as uh, just separating the issue of impeachment, the evidence that we were presented uh, at, at the uh, uh, committee level, the Special Investigative Committee, uh, was uh, pretty, uh, uh, I, there was just a lot of uh, wrongdoing as far as his position as governor. Now, uh, criminal cases take on their own uh, life. Uh, I do think it's interesting that uh, some of the names and the folks you hear in the news uh, nowadays were part of the FBI uh, that is being kind of uh, the subject of uh, Senate hearings today. So all of this stuff uh, is intriguing, but the overwhelming amount of evidence that we were presented during the, the committee phase is all outlined in the book in great detail. Uh, my view is that earlier, much earlier, probably two to three years earlier, those uh, impeachment proceedings could have started. In fact, uh, Mike Bost, Congressman Bost now, and I stood up uh, in 2006 on the House floor during one of those numerous uh, special sessions the governor liked to call and said, hey, look, we're in Springfield. You're calling us in every day. Maybe we should do something. We're sitting here doing nothing. We gavel in and gavel out every day. How about if we don't start looking into impeachment of a guy? Uh, because at that time, there were a lot of uh, rumors uh, uh, about campaign funds, board appointments, and those types of things. So uh, I, I think, you know, when people look in the book or even online or elsewhere at the amount of evidence, they can make their minds up. But for, as for me, uh, you know, the issue of whether or not he should have been impeached was a simple answer. I am dropping the name of the federal, uh, the uh, Speaker Madigan had an attorney, I believe it's David, and I'm, I, I, who prosecuted Rob Blagojevich in the Senate. David, David Ellis. Ellis. Uh, and I apologize to David, it's been <laughs> so long. I'm, I'm also getting older. I, I tend to drop names from time to time. But uh, I interviewed David Ellis at length uh, after the impeachment, sometime after, we spoke for about an hour and a half. And I'm glad we did that because we recorded this uh, kind of for historical purposes at that time. And uh, David Ellis was telling me that Speaker Madigan didn't trust Rod Blagojevich and very uh, quickly in the governorship of Rod Blagojevich, uh, Speaker Madigan never wanted to be in a meeting with him alone and as David Ellis said, uh, pretty soon, uh, the speaker never wanted to be with the governor at all. So uh, <laughs> certainly it goes to the um, non-functionality of Illinois state government. And, and just because they were both Democrats didn't mean that there is any love uh, affair going on between Speaker Madigan and Rob Agoyevich. They just didn't trust each other. Uh, I, I, I think it would be fair to say they still don't. Uh, but... Uh, so as you say, long before uh, Rob Agoyevich was arrested, uh, there were, it, it was a dysfunctional government. And many times uh, we would have to be in, uh, I in the, in the press corps, you know, covering the legislature and efforts to get a budget passed all across the summer. And of course, you're supposed to have that done by the end of May. So, um, Well, Terry, I, I mean, if you... Uh really kind of uh, history will tell the story better than I can. But if you go back to the, the, the facts surrounding when the governor, for exam example, decided early on in his administration that he was going to buy a flu vaccine 
from Canada, which was a violation of federal law. And, you know, uh, after that, uh, countless instances of ignoring basically what the state uh, General Assembly was doing. Uh, healthcare expansion is a good example. Uh, he, he started uh, to, to uh, expand healthcare in various ways, but, but wanted Illinois covered, which was the really kind of massive expansion that was supposed to be paid for by a gross receipts tax, if you'll remember. Uh, the gross receipts tax was soundly rejected, and I mean soundly. Uh, I don't think there was a single vote in favor of it, but the governor implemented the expansion of uh, health care coverage. Uh, you know, he did it by emergency rule. Uh, then when JCAR uh, said no to the rule, he called JCAR an advisory group and implemented <laughs> Illinois covered anyway. So uh, those are just a couple of examples of what I think those in the General Assembly uh, felt what was kind of this gross uh, disregard for the balance of power uh, in the General Assembly. I'm just quite frankly, still to this day, uh, really disappointed that steps weren't taken sooner. Uh, because if they would have been taken uh, during the time that some of this was happening early on, uh, I think we would have avoided the probably most embarrassing uh, example of his uh, abuse of power and, and maybe the one that the, the nation knew the most about and that's when uh, Barack Obama became elected president and the Senate seat became up for basically highest bidder consideration. So uh, that part of it would have had yeah, you know, one of the things, I, I went to Washington uh, for the inauguration of Barack Obama to cover the Illinois delegation, and I remember interviewing then-Lieutenant Governor Pat Quinn and thinking how bizarre it was that we were all in Washington, D.C. for the first person from Illinois to be going to the White House since basically Abraham Lincoln, and knowing that the following week we were all going to go home and impeach the governor. So you had this this high pinnacle of success in Illinois politics to be followed immediately thereafter by uh, one of the worst chapters. Uh, it was a bizarre time, and it's a bizarre time, I'm sure, for you to have served in the legislature and to have had to dealt with a, a governor like that. I would also say, in sharp contrast, uh, not that I'm endorsing all the policies of uh, Governor Pritzker, but I think everyone was glad that last year in his first term, everything seemed to actually work smoothly and the man functions kind of like a governor should. He seemed, he seemed to get things done and, uh, and work with the legislature to get it done. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not uh, obviously uh, aware of a lot of the inside details. I do know that uh, it's a lot easier to things, uh, for things to get done. We have a super majority in both the House and the Senate uh, of the same party, uh, but you still have to work with people. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, whether you agree or disagree with the rules or you uh, agree or disagree with the, the super majority, those are the facts that you uh, have. One of the subtitles in the book uh, has to do with the cards I was dealt and the lessons I learned. Uh, every every session, uh, when I was a member of the General Assembly, the five terms I was there, we were in the minority or, or close to the super minority. Uh, so you gotta work within that structure to try to do the best you can for your constituents, while still, of course, uh, making sure that at the end of the day, you don't compromise the principles that, that are uh, most important to your constituents. So. You know, I, again, I, I don't know a lot of the details of the current governor's uh, spring session. Uh, obviously, you know, um, he was, according to all accounts, as far as his uh, uh, agenda, uh, pretty successful at clicking off some of the things that, that were important to him. So uh, I, I would only say that that kind of thing's easier when you have uh, a large majority of the numbers. You know, the rule of 60 over there is still pretty powerful. Roger, uh, one of the things that you say in the book is that uh, a lot of people 
don't really understand the workings of Illinois state government and uh, that the way a bill is passed in Springfield is not necessarily the way they read about it in a book or how it's heard on Schoolhouse Rock. So w what would they be surprised to know is how legislation moves here in the state capitol? Well, I, I think the, the biggest surprise would be the absolute power that one individual has over the process. Uh, the rules of the House uh, are adopted uh, at the beginning of, of every General Assembly session, which is a two-year session. And those rules allow for basically absolute power for the Speaker. Uh, he has a majority of appointments to all committees. Probably the most important and powerful one is the Rules Committee, where all legislation is processed through. And uh, you know, uh, those folks in the Rules Committee, if your bill doesn't get out of Rules Committee, it can't go to a standing committee, which means it can't be considered. Uh, and, and the Speaker uh, appoints a majority to, the, to that committee, and they serve at his pleasure. They can be removed at any time by the Speaker. And that's true for every committee. Once the, the Executive Committee, which you know is also a very powerful committee, has the same kind of majority control. Now, I was in the minority, so obviously I, I, I'm going to complain about that, right? But I think in a democracy, we should all be concerned uh, when any one individual has that kind of power, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat. Uh, and, you know, uh, there are rules uh, that some will argue that allow you to get a bill discharged to the House floor. Uh, that is true, but it takes a unanimous consent of the entire body for that to happen. Well, the Speaker is also a member, so if he's not going to let it through Rules Committee, he's not going to vote to discharge it. So I, I just think people sh would be shocked uh, that that, that uh, takes place. Uh, I think they should be a little concerned and shocked that uh, bills can be uh, posted with uh, within a short period of time with thousands of words. And this isn't something people don't know. But budgets normally are put on shell bills and passed within you know, hours of the time they're first introduced. And uh, that's also done through a process that although rules are in place, the majority party can make a motion to waive the rule uh, and things can be posted within hours. And, and I think the media is frustrated with that just as, as much as anyone else. They can't even read what's in a bill, uh, know what they're reporting about. Uh, and, and that happens often on the House floor. The staff, uh, which does a lot of the work related to making sure members know what uh, is contained in a bill, they don't even have time to read it. Um, well, and that's so, the one thing I, I wanted to say, and we're kind of skirting here. You know, when we get down to the end of the session, as you say, I mean, we're, they're going to pass a budget. The, the most recent one was $42.9 billion. This legislative session obviously was truncated because of the coronavirus. But typically, uh, the members are going to get the bill that they're going to have, the, the budget bill, uh, and they may only have the budget for two hours prior to voting on $40 billion. Uh, and obviously, no one can know everything that's in that budget or what they're voting on. It's impossible. And as you say, too, a, a shell bill, for those who don't know, it's basically it's a, it's a bill that goes through with a number on it, but there's no wording in there. Uh, it, it may say, uh, you know, for two to pass two dollars to the budget or whatever. And then later on, they'll add an amendment to that bill uh, and that the amendment becomes the bill. So half the time, it's there's no point in even reading some of this stuff because they change it. Uh, you know, whatever you read the bill to be at one hand gets changed or, uh, you know, the budget is added to some other bill. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a shell game. And, and it, it really does seem like a crazy way to try to run American democracy. Well, it's frustrating. It's frustrating for everyone. Uh, and, you know, it, I, it's really, I don't think, uh, fair to the people of the state of Illinois, uh, but in the book, I do outline that process. I actually take uh, several pieces of legislation that uh, I sponsored from the idea stage. You know, someone brings somebody an idea, whether it's a constituent or, or an organization representing a large group, and it goes to the Legislative Research Bureau for its first draft. And 
then the lawmaker gets it back and gets a chance to read it. And uh, I, I have outlined in this book the entire process, how then that idea uh, travels through the Rules Committee, uh, Standing Committees, to the House floor, first, second, third reading, hopefully out of the House, over to the Senate, to the governor. And, and I do it in a way that mixes in the obstacles. So people have to you know, get a, uh, an understanding of the rules and maybe you know, uh, a better understanding of the power of one individual in uh, trying to get a bill passed. So uh, I was a, a, a civics and government teacher uh, before I became a high school principal. And uh, I would teach civics and government today much differently than I did when I was a teacher, uh, just based on my experience. In fact, I, I teach a little bit, uh, I guess to teach uh, in the winter when we're in Florida. And uh, I taught us eighth grade civics class this last year. The kids were absolutely fascinated uh, with, uh, you know, how a bill travels. And I actually went on the Illinois General Assembly website, found a bill that I had sponsored and, and demonstrated to them all of the different uh, movements that took place through the bill and, and how a bill really goes through that process. So, uh, you know, the book has a lot of civics in it too. Uh, and that's kind of all intertwined with this time period from 2003 until 2009, when they uh, put uh, handcuffs on the governor. Uh, and a week, a couple of weeks later, we had a committee. And again, I, I get back to the point that it, at some point, uh, you know, we have to really wonder why it took that long in this process when all of the signs were there that we should have done something earlier. To, to your knowledge, and, and, and in talking to some of the other members of the legislature when you were a member of the body, uh, how, how different was the atmosphere under Governor Blagojevich compared to previous governors? Well, and again, I, I came in when Blagojevich was... Uh, so you came in so, in 03, right, January? Uh. Right. So previous governors, the only thing I can do is recount how uh, they would on a second hand. I, my, anything I'd say would be second hand. But uh, I, I think the lack of uh, seriousness and serious approach and uh, the commitment to really working with the General Assembly you know, uh, Rod was uh, always interested more in being the enemy of the General Assembly. Uh, he had a lot of enemies, right? I, I remember because I was in education, he described the Illinois State Board of Education as a Soviet style bureaucracy. <laughs> and he tried to do away with that, if you remember that. Yeah. You know, uh, and the General Assembly he, he was. He always a, had a whipping uh, boy. He, there was always somebody who was, was a bad guy, a, and he was the good guy. Yes. Well, and when the gross receipts tax was introduced, you know, he talked about uh, the percentage, small percentage of individuals who controlled such a large percentage. So the, the wealthy became the whipping boy one year. It, it just uh, depended on the year. And, and again, uh, those are the, uh, some of the details that are in the book uh, during his inauguration uh, speech, through his budget and state of the state addresses. Uh, there, I, I researched a lot of the, the rhetoric that he used. And in many cases, he did identify, you call it a whipping boy. I, I think there was a lot of strategy behind it. Uh, in the end, it didn't work. And you know, big part of the reason it didn't work is uh, he, uh, he ended up uh, really running counter to the one person who could stop him, uh, whether it was policy uh, or politics. And that was Mike Madigan. Um, I do think that this happened during a difficult time uh, for Speaker Madigan because, uh, as you recall, there was a, a great attempt by the Speaker, in, in fact, moving the date of the Illinois primary, if you remember that one, uh, to support uh, Senator, then Senator Barack Obama in his run for the presidency. And, uh, you know, one of the things I, I ponder in the book uh, is whether or not taking action earlier. Then the speaker chose to related to Rod Blagojevich had something to do with the the, the Illinois you know, Democratic Democratic Party brand and making sure that that brand didn't get uh, soiled uh, during the years leading up to uh, Barack Obama's run for the presidency. You know, there's a lot of possibilities, 
but it, it doesn't make sense for many, many of the evidence, uh, pieces of evidence that I outline in the book to come from years uh, 2003, 4, 5, and 6. Uh, but nothing was done. And, you know, it, it really kind of took handcuffs uh, to get any action. Um, and again, uh, those years uh, after 2006, 7, 8, you asked about lawmakers earlier. Uh, I think, by and large, we would just shake our head that uh, some of the things that were happening were happening. I, before we let you go, uh, when you left the legislature, and, I, and we should also point out, by the way, you were one of the members of the legislature on the Republican side of the aisle that worked on the budget. So when you talk about budget issues, you're very familiar with it. Uh, do you have on the budget uh, approach, when you talked about how uh, they throw it on the table uh, for members to vote on it about two hours or so before before they vote, do you have any reforms, any ideas that, that you said you would say uh, would be a, a better way to put together a budget? And we always hear, you know, under the Constitution, I think I think there's some debate about this, that it's supposed to be balanced under the Constitution. Some people say that's not true. Uh, but we never seem to have a balanced budget. We keep adding to our, our debt. Uh, what could we do differently on the budget? Well, look, I, there has to be a point at which, and, and, it, and it will come at, at, at some time, uh, you cannot uh, continue to spend more money than you take in. And I, I think, you know, when the state was $13, $14 billion uh, out of balance as far as cumulative totals, there was a recognition of that, right? And finally, uh, an income tax vote took place. And uh, by the way, uh, I outline uh, very, very detailed how that happened uh, under a lame duck General Assembly the first time when it went from uh, three, uh, three 3% to basically 5%. Uh, but without additional revenue, uh, the way that spending has uh, increased, I think when I went to the General Assembly in 2003, Terry, uh, operating budget was around $30 billion, 31 maybe. Um, and what did you say it was 42? The budget that just passed is 42. That may have bond payments involved uh, with it as well. Yeah, but 42.9 um, is. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, uh, there's going to be some natural inflation involved with that. Uh, people make decisions as to whether or not uh, additional government programs, expansion of current programs. Well, the pensions, obviously, they keep going. With the 3% increase, they, they keep going. And uh, the, that's something and again, that's, that, that's a, kind of an entitlement. That's a result I mean. of, well, that's also a result of General Assemblies in the past uh, deciding that, you know, instead of making the payment that was due, they would spend more money on X, Y, or Z or expand this program or that program. And so uh, they... They didn't make or they shortened and and you can go through the Blagojevich years there are several instances going back to the time that uh, the 10 billion dollar bond scheme was passed early in his uh, uh, time as as governor uh, and the payment was completely skipped because they were uh, you know selling bonds and that's nothing but borrowing into the future and again uh, that's a that's uh, there's been several commissions task forces that have looked into uh, what the cause is certainly some of the benefits are more lucrative than uh people like to see or maybe even uh folks pay but the state uh and their abdication of the payment has been such a big part of that uh but you're right uh that's obviously something that has to be dealt with uh along with other uh, continued expansion of, of spending. And I'm, I'm a lifelong educator and I love to see public education uh, spending because I, I think it's uh, uh, a possible way to, to help people to uh, better their lives and fulfill their dreams. Uh, and those were some of the years, you know, when the pension payments were shorted, uh, additional money was put into public education. And, um, you, you know, you can't spend a dollar twice, right? Uh, but that, that's, I, I would just say that at some point or another, there has to be a reckoning 
to the spending side because no matter what, uh, more money will be spent. There, there are just way too many people that want to spend money on way too many programs. So uh, I, I think you have to look at that side and, and recognize it. Now, uh, the idea that you can do it through a, a graduated income tax, uh, that's going to be up for a lot of debate this summer leading up to the, the fall. And my biggest concern with that uh, isn't the fairness issue. I, I, I think somebody might be able to make an argument about that, but um, anything that adds to the revenue side until something is done about the spending side, uh, I think is a mistake. You know, and, and I know a lot of people criticize, I mean, even here, we knew the state was going to be losing billions of dollars of revenue because of the government sh or the economy being shut down. And yet, uh, did the state tighten its belt? Did the state make cuts and say, we're not going to spend as much? No, they spent $2 billion more. It went from $40 billion to $42.9 billion. So uh, I think that frustrated a lot of people. It's like, how many people in the private sector are having to cut back? And here you, you don't make any cutbacks? Uh, and the little bit I hear about that, or I know about that, uh, makes that dependent on whether or not uh, – Five billion or close to five billion of that amount is borrowed from uh, the federal government. Uh, so again, uh, borrowed money is not earned money. It's not revenue. It's not you know, something that is recurring. And you build into one side of the budget uh, expenses that are recurring, while on the other side of the budget you're paying for those uh, spending items with money that's one time, and not only one time, but or double the pain one time and borrowed. Yeah, let me uh, let me throw out a couple of things real quick. Uh, one, uh, coming out of this coronavirus, we I just interviewed a uh, superintendent up in the Lagrange area, and we were talking about how they've been teaching people online. Do you hear anything? Are you, are you keeping in contact with your former colleagues in the education arena? And uh, have you heard how that's gone? And will there be any lasting? changes from this almost like an enforced social experiment uh well maybe there'll be some improvement in the way uh education through technology is uh, delivered maybe there will be some improvement uh, by and large though I, I think most of the, the educators i i talk with i have two daughters that are teachers uh the importance of having children with them in the classroom can't be replicated uh, online, especially for the students who need it the most. So, you know, I, I think that is recognized. Obviously, the health and safety of children at a time when there was sheer panic about their safety necessitated that you try to do whatever you have to do. Uh, but I think we're a long way from the time where, where we can uh, confidently say that that you know online e-learning uh, those types of efforts are are even close to replicating with what happens with uh, a classroom and a teacher and interaction and and hopefully safely uh, in a healthy environment we'll be able to get our children back into a classroom this fall yeah hopefully i mean it's uh, in fact uh, just as we tape this on the 11th of June, the governor of Missouri just announced that they're going to fully open their economy on June 16. So uh, Illinois is still kind of uh, behind the, the, the pace of reopening from what other states, uh, I, I don't say that maybe that's what we should be doing, maybe not, but other states are opening up faster both up in Wisconsin and Indiana and now Missouri as well. So uh, hopefully the people can get back, the students can get back, the teachers can be back with them. Obviously being face-to-face -face with students makes a big difference in a lot of ways. Um, before we close out, is there anything you want to add? And, and let me ask uh, on your book, uh, how many pages? Uh, what motivated you initially to write it? And, and then let's, uh, where can we, one buy it? Well, the book is, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking it's around 280 pages. Uh, and the uh, initial motivation came uh, 
because folks really thought that uh, there was a misunderstanding. There, there was this idea maybe uh, after, what, eight years that uh, the governor's been in prison, uh, especially with his rhetoric that somehow he had been mistreated uh, by the system. The, and, and I thought it was important for people. You know, people would say to me, well, the governor got uh, pardoned. Well, he didn't get pardoned. Uh, his sentence got commuted. And that kind of began me to, uh, toward this path. Of, hey, you know, people really need to know the facts, the evidence behind it. And that, like I said, expanded it into a book about uh, civics and, and really kind of some elections, my early elections, you know, how a guy who was sitting in his office as a school superintendent in a small rural school district was approached by business people uh, who wanted you to run for office and you end up in the row, front row of, a, of, a, <laughs> of an impeachment uh, trial. So that, that was the motivation behind it. I had several months uh, to research and write it uh, with a backdrop of the uh, Trump impeachment, by the way, which is so much different uh, in many, 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 many ways from the impeachment uh, of the governor. Uh, just start with one. It was a near unanimous bipartisan vote. Uh, it was actually unanimous uh, in the Senate to remove the governor. Uh, and that was not even close to what the case was, uh, the, the evidence itself, those types of things. So setting the record straight about that was one of my intentions as well. Uh, and the book, uh, for those people who uh, enjoy an e-book, uh, in fact, uh, th that seems to be the preferred method so far of purchase. And that's just Amazon, uh, amazon.com, uh, type in a front row seat or my name. And it goes to a page where you could download it and, and read it uh, immediately in a, a Kindle form, format, ebook. Uh, or uh, there is a uh, soft cover option there uh, at Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble uh, website. There, there's an option for hardcover, soft cover. Uh, but either Barnes and Noble or Amazon uh, are the are the two best sites to go look for the book and. Uh, easily easily purchase it uh, as we sit here and speak I'm, I'm waiting for a shipment of books that i ordered as the author that uh, because of uh, increased shipping times related to uh, I, I guess the pandemic or the uh, weather here uh, depending on what happened in certain areas where books are I, I, my, my book shipment is something i'm sitting here waiting on my first shipment is used up and gone uh, so I'm kind of at the same. Are you going to uh, be mercy, sitting but, there uh, autographing the books that you send them out? Or? Well, I've had a fair number of requests for that, uh, and I'm happy to do that. Uh, and and I, 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 I've uh, been on a few radio shows. Uh, people get real interested. It's interesting, right? Social media is an interesting thing. I, I was principal in Watsika for uh, five years, Watsika High School, and the uh, uh, the, once the word got out that the book was there, I, I had a call from uh, the uh, news director at the WGFA radio right there in Watsika, and I did an uh, interview with him, and all of a sudden, a whole bunch of former students <laughs> and, and former colleagues, I was principal, so teachers that talked, they, they would like a signed copy of the book, which I'm happy to do, as I mentioned. I'm happy to do that. Uh, I just don't have any right now uh, be, because... Uh, my initial supply is is all uh, dried up, but uh, you know I I, I appreciate uh, really the initial success, uh, and, and I certainly appreciate uh, you helping me get the word out. Um, and uh, just to add, Terry, I, I appreciated the work we did together over a number of years uh, when I was the director of the school boards in Illinois, and you remember. Uh, with the other associations, Dr. Clark and Jacoby and, and Leahy, well, we, we developed a blueprint for education we called Vision 2020. And uh, it took several years, but uh, ultimately, uh, mostly through the efforts of Brent Clark and Mike Jacoby, I'll, I'll say that uh, for sure, we ended up with a new funding formula in the state, which people wanted to do for years and years and years. Right. So. Uh, your help in that and getting the word out and, and uh, helping educate people both through the channel and at our conference. You were a mainstay at our, our conference. And uh, I appreciate that. And I appreciated working with you for those many years, both as a legislator and as a director. Well, I appreciate that. And, and uh, you know, I appreciate 
what you've done. I think it's a great idea to write a book. I didn't know you were going to do it. You just contacted me a little bit ago, but I think it's a great idea, both because now we have Governor Bogoyevich going around saying he was railroaded, and it's good to have some people who were his contemporaries setting the record straight from their point of view. And I also think that it's very important that people have an idea of what's going on behind the scenes with a bill. When we're covering the legislature, all we can say is this bill didn't get out of committee, did get out of committee. But people need to know uh, what's actually going on. What are the realities of how uh, the state government is working or not working, as the case may be? So I, I think for them to read your book is very important, not only for now, but also this is the kind of thing too that's important for the future generations of Illinois. You're gonna look back at this period of time and what we'll call the Madigan generation perhaps, uh, and, and find out how did this one man, the longest serving House Speaker in the history of the United States, control Illinois state government for, for good or harm. Uh, and obviously we are, uh, financially not in very good shape, we'll say that. But uh, And also, and I would close and say, uh, relative to uh, the other members of the education establishment, everyone's always open for criticism. But I, I think when we can do these interviews, as we've done today and we've done before with Mike Jacoby and Brent Clark, education is terribly complicated. There's, there, uh, as, as you know, you're spending billions and billions of hours, you have to accommodate so many different whether it's the uh, people, whether the teachers, the administrators. Yeah, Jacoby Clark and, and uh, Leahy, uh, working with him was a high, one of the highlights of my career. They were, they're great guys who care deeply, deeply about kids. And Tom Bertrand, who uh, uh, took my place, is, is in that same ilk. So I think that uh, that group is still doing really, really good things and keeping a good eye. They're just going through a very, very difficult time. I, you know, I, I was in education for 38 years and what they're facing now uh, and, and trying to figure this whole thing out and keep kids safe. Uh, they're the right guys. Thanks for watching. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.